Hello and welcome to day two of the U.S. History Star Review. So if you've already done part one, this should be continuing your notes. If you haven't done part one yet, you should probably go back and do that first. This lesson is going to cover imperialism starting in around 1898 through the New Deal in the 1930s. So imperialism is when the United States moves across from its territorial acquisition trying to move farther um, taking on more and more territories. So our main goal in this is to acquire raw materials. Um, we start with this acquisition of Alaska with the Klondike Gold Rush. This is just after the Civil War. Uh, Seward, who is the Secretary um, of State during the time, gets a lot of flack for this. Um, but Alaska turns out to be a pretty good purchase. Um, we follow this up in uh, the 1890s with the annexation of Hawaii. Stanford B. Dole, who is a, you know, entrepreneur here in the United States, plantations, overthrows the Queen of Hawaii and establishes his own government. There have been many missionaries that were set up there, but basically he and uh, some mercenaries and things take over the government. Um, the Hawaiian citizens protest this because, of course, they want their own government, but the U.S. want control of the natural resources and this great military location. Um, Alfred Thayer Mahan is a leading imperialist who's urging the Americans to increase the size of their navy during this period, and it's going to be incredibly influential. Uh, here is a question. You should read it. You should answer it. If you have questions, talk to me. The big uh, place that we are trying to get in this time period is China. China is the place where all, raw or where all materials go, where there are great markets, so we would like to be there. However, we fear that basically China is going to be carved into a whole bunch of colonies like the rest of Asia has been. So we set up with Europe the open door policy, basically saying that China should be kept open to trade with everybody equally. Works out super well for Europeans, not so well for the Chinese. Basically, it's that the U.S. just wants to protect its trade with China. Question, you should answer. Summary, you should be able to do this. Okay. Okay. We then get involved in the war that basically introduces the United States to the world stage, the Spanish-American War in 1898. Uh, president Teddy Roosevelt, future president, um, resigns his commission as the undersecretary of the Navy and basically decides that he's going to go be a soldier. Rounds up some people, you know, takes on one hill, fights his splendid little war, has a great time. Uh, the causes of the Spanish-American War are yellow journalism, lots of people writing papers, writing press about how terrible Spain is, the sinking of the USS Maine, which as we remember was probably not the Spanish, was probably, you know, just the Maine blowing up, the United States economic interests, aka the sugar in Cuba, and the DeLome letter where basically the Spanish dissed our president, and we did not like that. Um, the effects is that the U.S. is now a huge world power. In just a few days, we've taken out one of the biggest powers in the world, at least traditionally, and have acquired a ton of new, really strategically important territory. The Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and also Cuba gains its independence. Not really independent. We passed the Platt Amendment saying that we can't actually acquire Cuba, but really it's under the dominance of the United States until Fidel Castro. So summary, answer it. Question, answer it. U.S. is now in a position of world power. They are now able to basically be this world police. This is because of the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Remember the Monroe Doctrine said, hey, Europe, you got to stay the heck out of uh, our hemisphere. We couldn't actually enforce it, though, so it didn't really do too terribly much. Also, Europe didn't really want to be here, so it didn't matter. Roosevelt adds sort of a, a sort of a little you do this or else with his big stick diplomacy. Basically, he says that Europeans stay out of Latin America, and if you don't, we will use force to protect our economic interests in that region. That the hemisphere that we are in is now American territory, not anyone else. Question, answer. So dollar diplomacy is how we really, like, organize this. So basically, this policy prevents European countries from collecting debts that are owed to them by Latin American countries. The U.S. says it will send troops to make sure the money was repaid and that they would handle it, so basically acting as the bank for the European countries. Basically, this furthers the financial power of American businesses, fur furthers the power of America in these Latin American countries. This is mostly happening under Taft, expands a little bit under Wilson, but really is a Taft policy. So make sure you can answer this. Basically, control of Latin America through these different policies. The reason that we have a lot of care about Latin America is that, you know, to get to one side of our country from another, we need to cross through it. As demonstrated by the voyage of the USS Oregon, it's going to be really hard unless, you know, we cut a hole in uh, the Isthmus of Panama. 
So we helped to ferment a rebellion in Panama, um, basically set up a, a new state, and the U.S. buys the land, or at least leases the land, from the Panamanians. Um, we build this canal so the Navy can now move quickly between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. We need this because we've acquired all this like brand new territory in the Pacific Ocean. This is going to make trade easier and really help the United States emerge as a world power. Construction was super difficult of this Panama Canal because the workers had to cut through bedrock without any heavy machinery. The French had tried this before. The French, you know, died in numbers. We read that quote that talked about how, like, the French were just dying, you know, in the dozens and that basically you would only construct this by constructing your own grave first um, because the workers are exposed to diseases like malaria and yellow fever. This leads to the advent of, like, um, new pesticides and new ways of, like, preventing malaria and yellow fever. So this brings us all to World War I. World War I is going to be incredibly um, impactful on the world, a little bit impactful on the United States. So the main causes of World War I in Europe are militarism, everybody's buying stuff. If Germany has a bunch of guns, France better get them too. Alliances, everybody has a secret pact with somebody else to attack the other. Imperialism, everyone is fighting over all of these territories. And so once one country goes to war, basically the whole world's at war because like all the colonies are at war too. And nationalism, if you were super patriotic about your country, you were super likely to go fight for it. This is all set off by that spark of the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. We talked about that really anything could have led to this happening because everything was just so tense and ready to go. The U.S. stays out for quite a while. In fact, Woodrow Wilson in 1916 gets elected on his promise that he will keep you out of war. Um, but the United States does become more and more involved because of the unrestricted submarine warfare, the sinking of the Lusitania. Um, the Germans promise not to you know, attack any more ships, but then they start this again. The Zimmerman telegram, which asked Mexico to basically attack the United States, we do not take kindly. And then this overall threat to democratic nations. Our fear is that basically these like dictators are going to take over Europe and that our democratic friends are going to be left without any help. This should sound familiar from World War II as well. So uh, basically, we want to stay out as long as possible, but we are forced to come in because of all of these like alliances and various things that we have with Europe. So the United States declares war in 1917. We are in it for about a year. Um, and this ends the U.S. policy of isolation and neutrality when we declare war on the central powers. And we can argue whether or not the United States was actually neutral. We can look at like trade graphs, and, and we can see that maybe we were already playing favorites. But the official declaration of war does not come until 1917. Question, answer. Okay, Pershing. I uh, I wish we could spend like a year on World War One. Love me some World War One, but for the purpose of star, you just gotta know Pershing. Uh, Pershing is credited with most of the success during World War One. He's the guy that really transforms the American um, Expeditionary Force, the AEF, um, into an effective military force. Um, and really, Battle of Argonne Forest is the one battle that you need to know. There's a lot of comparisons made between Pershing and Washington that, like, they're the guys that, like, shape our American military. Remember, Pershing from previous times was the guy that's chasing around Pancho Villa as well. So World War I was particularly innovative for its, like, awesome, like, power and its ways to, like, kill you. We have these great ways of killing each other, but these terrible ways of, like, saving each other. Um, this is the invention of, like, you know, the tank and the other various things. So World War I te weapon technology is really the name of the game. We have poison gases, submarines, airplanes, tanks, all these various things um, that make us very vulnerable. And so it's much easier to defend your position than to attack. Therefore, you dig trenches and trench in, and really the war becomes at a stalemate, only moving a little bit at a time, particularly on those like fronts that get very much set up. Vaccines become developed and become very important because things are so unsanitary in those trenches. We looked at the pictures of the trench foot and the other really gross stuff. Um, so it's really important that we have these sorts of technological developments. Again, Battle of Argonne Forest, please know it. There are so many other really great battles we could talk about, but this is the one the Americans are really involved in. Um, this pushes us through the German defenses, even though the Germans thought it was impenetrable, and really helps to advance the war effort. Okay, World War I explain. Question, answer. Okay, this brings us to the conclusion of the war. Wilson has an end of the war plan, which are his 14 points. Basically... He looks at the causes of World War I and says, hey, what if we could write a document where we never do these things again? So what if we have freedom of the seas, where people can't just go around blowing up ships? 
What if there was self-determination? We didn't have all these territories. What if there was free trade, respect for neutrality, a creation of a League of Nations that would solve everyone's problems? Then there would never be a need for war again. In particular, he really wanted this League of Nations that was basically an organization that would mediate every dispute between nations and prevent future wars. However, back home in the U.S., we are over this. This war was crazy. We don't know why it was fought. There's lots of dead people, and there was mustard gas and all kinds of other terrible, terrible stuff. So we want to become isolationist again. So isolationist senators like Henry Cabot Lodge super oppose this membership in the League of Nations because they think it's just going to drag us into future war after future war. And so our own government won't sign it, therefore no one else gets behind this because they are way more content to try and blame Germany than to try and like solve any issues. Remember, Europe has been at war for four years. It has been a bloody and terrible war. They want someone to punish for all of this. Germany's the last man standing, so they or who they, they punish. Um, so the Treaty of Versailles becomes this very vindictive document that really is going to lead to World War II um, because it puts all of the blame for World War I on Germany and really doesn't allow them a way out. So they are going to basically sink into a depression, feel very bullied, feel very much like they had no say in this, which is going to lead to the rise of Hitler and like the start of World War II. Um, on the home front, Wilson is basically just decimated after this. Um, he has a stroke. Things are very bad for him. And it's really this failure of his League of Nations that really, like, ends his presidency. Answer. 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 Okay, so the impact of the World War I on the United States, economically, it increases our economy. Anytime we have a war, um, it increases our economy because we are pushing, like, all of this production. Just like in World War II, uh, World War I is the United States where, you know, the economy that hasn't been decimated, there's no war taking place on our home front, therefore we can put all of our stuff into war. Um, women are entering the workforce in pretty bad, big numbers. Socially, during the war, we curtail civil liberties, we pass the Espionage Act, which makes it a crime to criticize the war, even though it's kind of taking away freedom of speech and not kind of like it is. But again, remember, like, Alien Sedition Acts back with John Adams, this is not, like, a brand new thing. Um, but the thing is, this is total war. Everybody is involved in the war effort in some way. Answer. Okay, so the major themes of isolationism and expansion during this time period. In this time period from 1898 to World War I, U.S. becomes a world power. We are USA, USA. We are on a roll. World War I makes us take a couple steps back because we don't think we want anything about that craziness. Um, basically, World War I, everybody's in the trenches until the tank like rolls everything over and tons of people die. Um, everybody blames Germany, which then leads to World War II. If you got that, you got like the very, very brief history of this. Again, I wish we could just spend forever on World War I. Okay, Roaring Twenties. What we want is a return to normalcy. We want to get back to the way things used to be. Uh, so we elect three kind of boring presidents that are all Republicans that want laissez-faire. Uh, they don't actually, you know, moderate as much as the progressives did, which leads to the Teapot Dome scandal. Warren Harding, his return to normalcy, uh, he has a cabinet that's maybe not so great. So they are doing a lot of scheming. One of them is actually leasing oil-rich lands in Teapot Dome, Wyoming in exchange for bribing. So those national parks that Teddy Roosevelt helped preserve, he's basically selling those that's like the property of the American people. This is one of those scandals that through the 20th century are going to lead us, the people, to trust less in our government. Question, answer. Okay, the economy is awesome. It is the roaring, it is the booming economy. Um, Basically, we were focusing on our consumer goods. So while World War One, we were focusing on these goods that are our, you know, war goods. Now we are turning that to a uh, home front sort of production. We have low taxes and mass production. So everybody is buying these new goods because if there's a car, like you want it, um, and people are purchasing these things on installment plans. They are buying on credit. Um, we have high tariffs, like the Holly Smoot tariff that we're enacted to help promote American business. Um, and so because we're producing so much, we don't really need to trade with the rest of the world. This helps to insulate us from this global depression that's starting to go on and really kind of perpetuates this myth that in the United States, everybody's doing well, everybody is buying, everything is great. Answer. Answer. 
in the 20s, pop culture is a thing. The 20s are really what I think of as like the advent of our modern era. The 20s are a lot like the 50s. We become like super obsessed with magazines and celebrities and music and films and things like this. Um, Charles Lindbergh becomes one of our biggest national heroes and biggest celebrities because he's the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. When his baby is kidnapped, the scandal of where the Lindbergh baby, baby is becomes the front page tabloid news everyone is following. Uh, Tin Pan Alley becomes the place to get your music. You get your sheet music, learn to play it there. We begin to learn how to record records. And we start this advent of the jazz era. Prohibition is really what's fueling this era. Remember the 18th Amendment banned the sale and manufacture of beverages. Remember all the way back, like in that time before World War, I'm sorry, before the Civil War, uh, we had all the women's groups that were advocating for various changes like abolition and things. Prohibition is part of that temperance movement because the idea is that liquor causes poverty, crime, ruins the family. And so the temperance movement is formed to stop the sale and consumption of alcohol. Uh, ironically, though, organized crime hugely increases because of this, and things are much more chaotic because... You took away something that people used all the time, so now ordinary citizens don't feel too terribly bad about breaking the law. This leads to the, you know, Al Capone and the gangster sort of culture. Uh, what we have in this period, too, are flappers, young women who are asserting their independence by rejecting traditional restrictions. These are often young women who are the daughters of immigrants um, who are basically trying to adapt to this American culture. Um, one of the reoccurring themes I've talked about in U.S. history is that it's all like basically kids rejecting their parents' ideas. And this is kids rejecting their ideas of their dodgy, you know, their stodgy uh, Victorian parents, right? Like trying to show that they can go out, they can cut their hair, they can dance, they can smoke, etc. And this is going to be, you know, the theme of U.S. history that we'll talk about with the 50s, the 60s, etc. Answer. Okay. Because we are so isolationist after World War I, because we want out of this, we have a red scare. We are pretty terrified of communism. Remember, Russia's fallen into communism during the uh, First World War. Uh, they back out of the war because of it. And for Americans, communism is basically like the scariest thing that can happen because it goes against all of our ideas of free market and freedom and all of these, these various things. Um, so basically, there's this fear that communists are infiltrating the United States um, and basically that you got to get rid of all these people that could be doing it. So the effects, it leads to more nativism. It leads to immigration quotas from areas that have like heavy uh, communist concentrations like Russia, Southern Europe, and just like straight up racism for anybody that is like different. This is the first of our Red Scare. The one that we usually talk about is the one in the 1950s, which is the McCarthyism that the Crucible is written about. Question, answer. Okay, the super down of this is the social Darwinism and the eugenics. People begin to do all these crazy pseudosciences during this period where they're measuring people's heads and saying that these people are better than these people and trying to basically help this idea of evolution along. Um, the most extreme of this is obviously Hitler, the Holocaust, where he's deciding to annihilate an entire people in order to advance this idea. Um, so this is sort of this dark side of this idea that, you know, there is some sort of perfect group, this dark side of Americanization of nativism. Um, but there are lots of people that are really buying into this in this time period. Um, another thing that we're seeing in the 20s is this huge conflict between rural traditional life and this new city like urban life. And we see this act out in the scopes, aka the monkey trial. Um, basically, a teacher teaches religion because he wants, to, or I'm sorry, teaches evolution because he wants to break this law. Um, he's arrested and there then becomes like the trial of the century. As I said in class, the judge should have just thrown this out, been like, yeah, you broke the law, charged him the $25, but they want to bring publicity to their town, so they have this huge trial. In it, Clarence Darrow, who's like the A1 number one like defense attorney, comes down, defends um, Scopes. Um, William James Bryan, who we remember as the cross of gold guy in the Populist Party and then the Democratic Party, the guy who resigned from the Wilson uh, administration over the issue of going to World War I, he defends this like biblical literalism and that you cannot be teaching this in schools. Um, people listening to their radio, it becomes like a national thing that everyone is like listening to and buying into. Brian dies like just a few days after this and becomes like this huge martyr in the eyes of like dying for the cause of this. Um, but this is a very controversial issue and shows that really we have like two very different opinions going on in the United States. Question, answer. Question, answer. Okay. 
In the meantime, um, lots of people are moving from their areas. In particular, African Americans are leaving the South because things aren't great for them there and are moving to the cities. In particular, they're moving to uh, New York, Chicago, various areas like this. This is called the Great Migration. Although, remember, we said there were lots of great migrations in U.S. history, so maybe remember this as, you know, something else. Um, but many African Americans moved from the South to northern cities during the early 1900s because of economic opportunities, industrialized cities. They're trying to get rid of the sharecropping, this racism that they're facing in the South. Um, this leads to the Harlem Renaissance, as all these people that were living in, like, very disparate communities all begin to gather in these neighborhoods. Um, they start talking, start writing, start uh, working together, and this leads to this giant... Um, growth of black pride and uh, African-American culture in the 1920s. Um, lots of music, jazz is the dominant musical form, uh, literature, poetry, all sorts of things. Um, Harlem Renaissance, definitely an American movement, jazz, American art form, American music. Question, answer, question, answer. Okay, all of this ends with the Great Depression. So basically, the Great Depression is caused by our high protective tariffs. We thought that we could keep out all the problems in Europe by keeping all of our goods in, all their goods out, but this does not work because we have overproduced. We have produced more than our people could ever buy because basically the prices keep lowering. Everybody's buying stuff on credit, so there's not a lot of real money in the system. People are speculating on the stock market, taking out loans to like uh, actually like Bit, bet on the stock market. There are bank failures, so you thought you invested your money wisely and then all of a sudden it's gone. Um, but the Great Depression starts with the crash of the stock market in 1929 and continues throughout the 20 or until the 1930s until World War II. It's not until the production of World War II that we're actually out of this depression. Question, answer, question, answer. So the effects. So we're not buying anything because no one has any money. Factories close. Millions of people lost their jobs. Many people are homeless, and some live in the things that they ironically name Hoovervilles. Remember we read those documents that were the accounts of children during the Great Depression? It really depended on your situation before the Depression, what your situation was during the Depression. But in all, it was not a great time. Um, there was a diminished need for labor, which caused hostility towards many immigrants, particularly Mexican-Americans. Um, Mexican Repatriation Act sent many Mexican-American immigrants back to Mexico, even though they were in the U.S. legally. And this is a theme that, again, had happened before in U.S. history and will happen again, as we will talk about, um, that when we have a high demand for labor, we invite people in, but then when that is gone and we have like economic hardships, we send them back, even though they were here legally. And government, we will talk about whether or not that actually is a thing we can do. Question, answer. Okay. So kind of contributing to the problem of all this is the Dust Bowl. Uh, with the Homestead Act, it led to lots of people moving out to this area that you know couldn't really sustain that much farming. Also, people are basically growing, growing, growing because the prices of crops are going down. So droughts and overproduction combined with heavy winds creates these huge dust storms that carry the topsoil for hundreds of miles. Um, basically, it makes the land unlivable. It makes it to where like people are like literally choking to death on the dirt around them. You can see these dirt clouds as far away as like Washington, D.C. And the farmers are forced off their land and to abandon their farms to move west in search of work. Um, they're not really well respected there. Um, Grapes of Wrath shows us the, the journey that one of these families takes, and it, it's not great for them. So if you're in the city, things are going very poorly for you. If you're in the country, things are going very poorly for you. Things are just not great during the Great Depression. Question, answer. Okay. Along comes Roosevelt. In the election, uh, he basically says, I got a new deal for you. We're going to try something different. He wins like a landslide because Hoover's like, it'll all get better on its own. Um, so basically, Roosevelt says that what you got to do is you have to basically have the government take an even greater role. So get rid of that laissez affair, get rid of all the things that have been going on in the 20s, and basically the government should handle the economy. He is influenced with that Keynesian economics uh, with the idea that basically the government has to basically facilitate the growth, do the prime, the prime pumping. Um, his main goal is relief, recovery, reform. First, you got to put like food in people's bellies, then you got to help the economy fix itself, then you fix the economy so it never happens again. Uh, 
He is also influenced by his first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, who also contributes to the presidency by helping the country by being the sort of moral support. Um, he uses his fireside chats to really communicate his ideas, and also Eleanor comes to various things and communicates ideas to the people. His New Deal programs are that alphabet soup that we talked about. Um, there are lots of them, as long as you know several of them, and the main theme is that they were helping people and helping the economy to grow, you're good. Also, if you can remember them in the categories of relief, recovery, reform, you're in a good place. The FDIC uh, is really important. It's what ensures your money today. Securities and Exchange Commission make sure that you can't buy and sell those stocks in the way that they were before. Social Security Administration takes care of people that are retired, unemployed, those in need. Uh, CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the WPA both provide jobs to those that need them. The AAA helps the farmers. Um, just lots of programs to help various segments of the economy to help them grow. This does help, but again, it's not until World War II that we're going to see the significant change in the economy that pulls us out of this depression. Um, Roosevelt does, however, overreach. Um, several of his things are considered unconstitutional. We talked about the poultry case and some others. So what FDR decides to do is that, you know, constitutionally it doesn't say how many Supreme Court justices we can have. So how about he just adds, like, you know, six more. Then, of course, all of his reforms would pass because his six guys would vote for it plus the other ones that already agree with them. Congress was like, that's not okay. You can't do that. The people were like, yeah, that seems a little intense. And so this is really 1937 where Roosevelt's scene is kind of overstepping. And this is kind of the end of that first wave of New Deal, like thinking of that 100 days where he can basically get anything done. But 1937, that, that is over. So the effects of the New Deal is that the power of the federal government is increased dramatically. Um, critics say that it endangers the free enterprise system because it increases the government's control in the economy. Um, now that's the government's responsibility to ensure that the economy runs smoothly and Americans continue to rely on New Deal programs today. So it's incredibly impactful in that many of the programs we rely on today are brought to us by the New Deal. Question, answer, question, answer. Okay, so major themes of the Great Depression, people were buying on margin, buying on credit, which led to this crash. We have unemployment. New Deal didn't solve the Depression, but it did make people feel better. Um, FDR increased the power of the government, and this is really the main thing to remember, that most of our debates through U.S. history as far as political are what is the role of the state or the federal government. We fought a whole civil war about it. Um, in the Gilded Age, the role of the federal government was like nothing. In the Progressive Era, it picked up after World War I, sinks down because we don't want to be in that anymore. This Great Depression and the New Deal is where it starts to pick up and where it's going to continue to go through the 20th century as we get into World War II uh, and the various things that are going to happen in the later part of the 20th century. Um, so that's the end of the review. Hope that it helped. Um, I know it went very quickly. I know the slides and the other things went, so you should definitely like pause it, look at the various things. Um, you could come in, talk to me, various things like this, um, if you were confused about any aspects. Uh, in any case, I will see you soon.